you really have to have some experience to understand where the bodies are buried or how things are really done. Uh, and I have, a, I have a long record, okay? And you can say that's, uh, does experience matter? Does knowledge matter? I think it does. I think that knowing stuff matters. Um, uh, number two, uh, you know, we're in a, a polarized political world these days. And what happens in that circumstance that we find ourselves in is that uh, the Democrats are in charge, you get criticism from the Republicans, and it's just partisan uh, spitballs being thrown you know, uh, it, it, you know, at the, at the, the people in power. Uh, and that it doesn't get the uh, examination because it's always put in that partisan frame. When you have someone of the same party uh, speaking truth to power and, 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 and following wherever the facts take you, um, I think that that's a platform that gets a lot more attention. Uh, from the media and from others, that uh, because they know that it's it's uh, it's man bites dog. That you're not supposed to say uh, things about you know the administration when your your party's in charge of it. Well, hello. Thanks for coming in and joining us. We appreciate it. Um, What's your name? <laughs> I'm Alexi Kasef. I am a capital reporter for Cal Matters here. Um, and we actually just wanted to start with some questions that are not entirely related to the job, but just more will give our readers a chance to know you in a different way. So the first thing I want to ask you about is what is something about California that you think the rest of the country gets wrong or doesn't understand about the state? Well, thank you, Alexi and uh, Cal Matters, for having me here and having this conversation. And for all those who are tuning in to try to get a little bit better informed, it's, uh, it's great to have this conversation. Um, I, I think that what the, the rest of the country doesn't understand about uh, California is our diversity. Uh, not just diversity of people, uh, but the diversity of places, uh, of how we're one state, but we have six or seven you know, mini states inside of our almost 40 million population, uh, and how, how the diversity of California has been a great asset for us, both in, in governance and in policy making, uh, in, uh, in our economic strength, um, in our connection to the world. Um, uh, we have so many immigrants here who have come from other places, uh, and it creates this very rich culture uh, that we enjoy at, at, in so many ways, not just the natural environment of California and the diversity in that respect, but the diversity of foods and, and cultures and languages. Uh, and I don't think that uh, the country is going to get a taste of it over time, but I don't think they have a sense of uh, uh, the wonderment that makes so many of us love this state, love all that we're doing and how we're doing it. And um, what's the most difficult thing you've ever had to do in your life? Um, uh, I think talking to my uh, siblings about the passing of my mother and father, I'd say those are rank up there pretty high of uh, uh, pretty traumatic events that all of us experience in our own life in some way. Uh, but, you know, as a, as a younger person, uh, you know, not experiencing death uh, as, as one experiences it as you age, I think that's... Uh, those are hard conversations and a hard reality check. Both my parents died young. Were you the, you were the one who had to inform your siblings that they had died? I think it's not just informing, but the conversations about the passing of your mother or your father. Uh, my father died of a heart attack at 55. Uh, so that's a pretty sudden thing. My mother died uh, of cancer at 57. And uh, she had gone through a number of bouts of uh, breast cancer, ovarian cancer. So it wasn't as much of a surprise, um, but it's nevertheless a, a very traumatic thing in anyone's life. Wow. So is, like, what did you sort of take away from those experiences that you've sort of carried with you forward from having to go through that? Uh, well, certainly the experience that, you know, as parents, you're always looking for teaching moments. And I give my dad great credit for uh, a teaching moment because I, I thought my life would end at 55. And so I lived my life. Uh, from that time forward with the idea that um, uh, life is precious. Um, it's not always how you would like it to be. And so take advantage of every opportunity, do your best, um, leave the world in a better place, but don't think it's gonna be 
uh, necessarily a long ride. And so I, uh, it allowed me to make a lot of, I think, great choices uh, about what I did with my life, where I worked, who I worked for, um, uh, living, living those years without regret. And then, of course, getting to uh, his age and still being around. I feel like I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm on bonus time so that I uh, now think of it in terms of uh, every year as a, as a blessing. Don't, get, don't think too far ahead, uh, but enjoy the time and, and still do your best um, and appreciate uh, every day. If you can tell our viewers, how old are you now? I'm 64. How old are you? <laughs> 58. Turnabout's fair play in case you guys are wondering about the questions you're going to ask me. Um, just sort of a last thing. Is there any political issue that you changed your mind about over the course of your career? Absolutely. I think part of thirst for information is to always reevaluate choices that you have made, perspectives that you have. And uh, that's an ongoing thing. And I think a very healthy one. I know in politics, you can kind of get into trouble for doing that out loud, like your question tries to provoke. Um, but I'll still answer it. Um, I've, I've, I'm starting to rethink regional agencies. Uh, what is that? Well, uh, because we know that uh, uh, functions of government cross lines, uh, city lines, county lines, like air quality, water quality, transit, uh, that we've created these regional agencies in our state. And what I have learned, and that makes a lot of sense, right? Because of the, the reasons that these things don't sit within a jurisdiction. Um, and, but what I have learned is that there's very little oversight of regional agencies. Nobody has any responsibility for the work that they do. And so that they don't get the scrutiny. A good example uh, is in the Bay Area, the Bay Area Rapid Transit System, BART. Three counties participate in the governance of it, uh, but they're independently elected. And uh, the agency has very little oversight and very little accountability. And if you, you hear complaints about it, and when you ask them who is your elected BART board representative, 98% of them have no idea, even though they voted on that person in the last election uh, or the uh, two years prior. Uh, and so as you look at these regional agencies, uh, sanitation, uh, it, it, parks, there really isn't that oversight. And so they can make spending decisions without accountability and review. Um, when you're within a city, you have a much better chance to have that kind of accountability uh, when you're elected by that city or by that county. But these regional agencies don't have that. Most people, they're obscure. I've tried to spend a lot more time in my service in the Senate looking at the work of regional agencies because nobody's looking at it. And uh, you know, I, I get at times criticized, why are you paying so much attention to BART? Well, it's a critical transportation corridor for my district. It needs to work well for my constituencies to do their work, to get to school, to get to doctor's appointments, whatever it is. Um, and nobody pays any attention except for the interested parties uh, of that agency. And so I've, I've rethought my, uh, my, my views of, of them and, and, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's focused me on oversight in an area that I'm not really directly responsible for except my constituents depend upon these agencies and they, and they matter. And, and no one's paying attention. But I guess if you've rethought it, I mean, do you think that they should be controlled by the state instead, by local governments? I mean, how, you know, what is the next step there in terms of resolving these issues that you think they have? Well, I don't have any grand plan to solve that problem, okay. Alexi, but uh, I do think that, uh, so for, for example, I served on a regional agency, the Trash Board. We did all the solid waste in an area that was bigger than my city. I was on the council for 10 years. Um, and uh, every decision that I had to make, I was still accountable in my city for raising rates, for changing service. There was at least some direct accountability as a council member serving on that agency. So I think that's, that's some healthy uh, feedback mechanism that for a lot of these agencies, they don't have. So there is an example of where uh, if you, if you uh, if you have elected representatives serving from a jurisdiction where there's accountability, then I think that could be healthier. So county supervisors serving on regional boards, there's some direct, better direct accountability there. I don't have any grand plan to try to solve it, but you asked me that question. But we can, we can spend some time afterwards. With that. <laughs> so does the controller have any authority on this issue? 
Well, the controller has the ability to audit the expenditure of any public dollars in California. Uh, and that means that uh, and you can do it on the pedestrian side, which are compliance audits, that you follow the law, you, you, you spend it as you were told to spend it. And then you have the programmatic audits to look at the effectiveness of how the money was spent. So the controller's office has a broad uh, 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 mandate and ability to go and look at uh, public agencies at every level, at the local level, at the state level, at the regional level, to see whether or not uh, the money is being spent the way it should be. Uh, and so, yes, the controller has the ability to make some choices. Obviously, it's a big state. There's a lot of problems going on. There's an expenditure of a lot of money in a lot of places. I'm sure we'll get into talking about that um, in terms of priority setting and the rest. But but a controller can, uh, if sees some problems, can go and, and, and audit that, age, uh, that regional agency. So would, I guess, based on what you're saying, would BART be a priority audit for you if you were elected? Well, I think you like to go to where you think the problems are. Um, and that, that could very well be BART. But I also think about where the public has the most impact by the work of the state. Uh, so I certainly think about schools. Almost half of the state budget goes into schools. We have 500 plus failing schools in our state. There's very little oversight of that as an example. We're going to spend over $12 billion on, on homeless, homelessness this year. And yet, uh, I think if you ask a member of the public, I think they'd say that that's, we've been failing badly. Where's that money going? How is it being spent? Uh, we're spending about $7 billion on mental health care in our state, at the county and state level. I have a bill on the floor of the assembly now that would require require that uh, oversight in terms of the effectiveness of that money. How is it being spent? Where is it being effect? Where is it being spent? Um, the reason that bill sits on the floor of the assembly after passing the Senate is because I, I've been told that the governor will veto it. And this is a general problem in government is that those in charge don't, don't want the oversight. They don't want the scrutiny. And part of the work of the controller is to be that independent eyes and ears that uh, can hold accountable the expenditure of tax dollars and have no fear, if you do the job correctly, have no fear or favor for those in power, whether it's the governor, the legislature, uh, the employment development department, the DMV, wherever it is that you, uh, you, you point your attention and your auditors to examine whether they're following the law correctly, that that's an independently elected post that allow you to do that. And, uh, and that's the type of controller that I would be. What about LCFF? You mentioned schools. What about an audit of LCFF funds? I think that's something that uh, that one would take a closer look at. There's a lot of questions of whether the, that money that we are allocating to schools in that in that program you used initials. I don't know if you're being very viewer friendly, by the way. <laughs> uh, I think you were here. Shake your head. How about in your candidate statement? You're going to have to do a little interpretation under the yeah. screen there what that LCFF means. What does a little thought bubble come out of your head? Local <laughs> control funding formula. It's a a, uh, a change in how schools were funded that Governor Brown instituted uh, when he was uh, the third time around in 2011 and 12. I'll help you out there. Which is a good question of how that's working, right? There is a good question. And uh, I think, once again, as, as I said earlier, we're spending so much on our schools now. The, the per pupil funding has, has gone up dramatically. And uh, I think that uh, a lot of folks want to know whether that money is being spent right. How is it being spent? And, and, are, and are we seeing results uh, in that additional spending? And there are a lot of powerful forces that don't want that oversight. So you also wrote in your candidate statement about auditing your fellow uh, legislators <laughs> um, about their travel costs and their expenses. Um, you know, what exactly are you referring to there? Or could you elaborate on that? And I, I assume you think if you audit places where you think something's going wrong or needs attention, what's going wrong and needs attention there? Well, I think that first uh, I wanted to make it clear that there is no sacred place in our state that, that somehow it should be protected uh, by the politicians, including the controller, that no space is free. Uh, we've had examples of uh, elected leaders at the local level and at the state level uh, involved in corruption and fraud and abuse uh, in their expense budgets and their travel budgets. Um, and I, I want to be clear that I uh, owe no favor and have no fear uh, about accountability for everyone, including uh, your elected leaders, that nothing should be off uh, out of bounds. Yeah, so oh. 
Um, hi, I'm Samia. I'm, uh, You're the floating head in the screen. <laughs> Yes, I don't know if, if the viewers can see you, but you look great. Um, so you've touched on this in a number of ways, but if, uh, how would you explain what the controller does to the average voter? Um, I, I would say uh, it is the person, it's the chief financial officer of the state responsible for the outflow of all the dollars that come in in terms of all the expenditures, uh, state programs uh, at, all, at all levels. Um, it, uh, it's a position that serves on more than 70 boards and commissions, many of them relating to the expenditure of public dollars. It also uh, administers the uh, unclaimed property fund. If you've lost track of some property, the controller has the responsibility to, to hold it and to try to find you so you can get that money or property back. Uh, but it's a constitutional office. It has independent authority in the state. Um, to do its work uh, free of the, the influence of the current administration or the legislature, uh, but to be the public's uh, watchdog over spending, uh, pr provide honest service, uh, ensure that uh, the, the funds are being spent as they are required by law and regulation. And if you're elected, what do you feel is the single most important thing you could do? Well, it's always hard to pick a thing. So I'll, I'll, I'll pick a, uh, I will say this, uh, fundamental to all of our work in government uh, is public trust. And if we, uh, if that trust erodes, it really under, it, it, it erodes the foundation of our representative government. And I think that what the responsibility of all of us in elective office at every level is to do everything we can in the toughness of the decisions that we make but to elevate public trust and confidence in the work that we do. And the unique part of the job of the controller is to bring to bear transparency and honesty in, in the spending of, of dollars, how it's being spent, how effectively it's being spent, and to do it in an honest way. And I think that if you do that, um, you're gonna take that value that's so important to our democracy, trust uh, in our elected leaders and try to elevate it in the course of your work. Um, are there, you mentioned um, education, the homelessness funding, um, are there other areas of the budget that you would focus on to make sure that the state is spending its money effectively? Well, I, I mentioned three. Um, there's so many more. <laughs> and I could spend the next hour and a half talking about all of them. Um, but I, I look to where the impacts are great. The, the numbers are high and the impacts are great. Uh, certainly, the $20 billion plus fraud at the Employment Development Department uh, does attract one's attention. Um, uh, some of the no-bid contracts uh, that have been uh, put out during COVID, um, you want to make sure that, the, that uh, the folks that had that took that money or, or doing, did the right thing. So again, I looked at to where, where is our biggest expenditure, where is it having the biggest impact or not uh, in terms of trying to make those tough choices. I know the office has a, a, a professional staff of very capable uh, auditors. I'd want to consult with them and, and get the intelligence that they bring to that conversation and, and others uh, in terms of making those important choices. Um, and are there any specific strategies that you would use to prevent waste and fraud? I, I think... Uh, making people be very clear that uh, you're not gonna get away with it, that you have an, uh, the Office of the Controller that's gonna be very diligent in tracking the expenditure of every public dollar. And we're gonna hold people accountable, small and large. No one is gonna be free from that accountability. And I think that if you do your job well, I think you're going to uh, start to minimize the abuses that do go on out there because they know that there's some uh, accountability police known as the controller that's gonna 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 watch uh, those the expenditure of those funds very carefully. Uh, hi, I just met you briefly, but I'm Grace. I'm our economy reporter. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about different proposals to give money to people, either on the basis of inflation, high gas prices. Um, do you support another broad stimulus payment or gas rebate? Uh, I do. I, I support the legislative leadership proposal that would provide. Uh, Two hundred dollars per each, for each individual uh, and households uh, 
that make uh, 125,000, I think, or less for a single uh, parent. Um, that would expend, that would, that would refund, I think, about $8 billion to taxpayers uh, if that proposal goes forward. And I think that's a prudent plan. It's focused on those who are most needy and, and those in the middle class, uh, excludes the very wealthy, which I don't think need the money. And so I think that's a more prudent expenditure plan that, uh, as that we're debating right now, and we will over the next few weeks. And one criticism of that plan is that it's not really tied directly to gas usage. What do you see as the, as the rationale for it? What's the motivation, if not gas usage? Well, at the heart of it is uh, helping those who are in financial distress because of higher prices. And it's more than just gas. It's rents. It's food. I think all of us are, are experiencing the higher cost of living. Uh, over the past year. So it is about trying to put resources uh, into people's pockets that are in need. And, uh, and that, that need comes across a wide array of impacts, including gas prices. Thanks. Um, you mentioned you know, this role sits on the board of the two big public pension programs. Um, how would you propose to reduce the debt of those two programs, CalPERS and CalSTRS? I have a light switch. You just turn the switch and it just goes. It's, it's amazing. Um, well, as, as you may know, um, uh, you know, first of all, we all want sustainable pension funds. The folks that have worked uh, in public employee their whole life, they deserve to have a, a good retirement and to have the resources there to provide for that. Um, the way the fund is set up is that there are three legs to the stool. You have the employee contribution, the employer contribution, and you have a rate of a, a return assumption that with those monies from the employee and the employer that you can get a rate of return to meet the obligations of, uh, of benefits that you've, you've contracted for. And under current case law today, uh, you're not allowed to change that. Uh, you can't go backwards and say we were just kidding on your benefits. So we have to meet that obligation, and that's the important part of the job. So do we have unfunded liabilities today? Yes, we do. Uh, a, a couple things. In the legislature, we've been allocating billions of extra dollars into those funds to help stabilize them. Um, is that going to solve the problem? No, I don't think that's going to solve the problem. Uh, so we, it is a challenge going forward, and it's one that I have, uh, I've written about, I've legislated on. Um, and uh, it's something that, as a member of the pension boards, I have an ability as controller to participate in those conversations. Now, what would I do going forward to change that dynamic so we don't keep making the same mistake? Uh, well, one, one place that uh, has, has been under debate, has had modifications and may need more, is that rate of return assumption that goes into determining those benefits. Uh, there are some who feel that that rate of return is set too high which creates an expectation of, of funding pensions that may not be there. And that if you set it at a more realistic level, then the employer and the employee going forward uh, would more honestly evaluate the, uh, the, or cover the costs. And that's something that is worthy of debate. And that's, that's a part of how do you uh, try to fix it going forward versus how you can go back and somehow change those commitments that have been made, which under court uh, decisions today don't appear to be options. Is that rate of return right now is seven percent still, or did that go? Down? I, I don't know if it's six and a half or seven. It's somewhere in that range. It had they have ratcheted down over the years, and I'd have to go check to see what that exact number is today. So, do you think it needs to be lower than whatever it is? Or I, I think it needs to be a realistic assumption. Uh, it has to be a realistic determination of rate of return over the course of the next 10, 20, 30 years, and unfortunately, it has been artificially high, where. Uh, and what happens is if, if, the, if, the, if the pension system is not funded, uh, who has to pay, what's, who pays the consequences of that? And under our system today, there's only one person, one entity that bears that responsibility, and that's the taxpayers. Uh, and I think that's not necessarily how that, a sustainable system should have been set up. So, I mean, I guess the concern that's always expressed about that is that you create two classes of employees, right? Sort of the ones who are grandfathered under the old system and then the new system with lower expectations of benefits. Is that just unavoidable and you just have to bite the bullet and do it at some point? Well, I, I, would, I would say it a little differently. I would say it's trying to, to uh, not make worse an existing liability problem and try to create a system that is actually sustainable for the employees and the employer 
going forward so that we don't have this liability uh, trap of billions that only the taxpayers have to cover. So uh, I think when someone decides to take a position in state employee, that they'll know what those salary offerings are and what those benefits offerings are, and they can make their own choices, whether that's a good situation for them or something else in the private sector. But if they want to come into the public sector, that we are realistic uh, about uh, the benefits we'd like to provide to them um, and the costs so that that can be clear and that it is a sustainable system for the newly hired teacher and, and firefighter and police officer that we don't get ourselves in this trap that we're in right now in this hole where we say this is not good. You know, we're billions uh, in the red and uh, it's, not, it's not a healthy situation. So this is again, both as a legislator and potentially as a controller, you wanna have fiscal responsibility. You wanna own up to your mistakes and not repeat them. And so, yes, I, I, would, uh, I would think that we need to do that smarter and better going forward. And, and sorry, to be clear, that means that you support lowering the benefit level for future employees, if, if that's what's necessary to make the system more sustainable? I support engaging with all the stakeholders to talk about what a sustainable pension system is going forward. And if it means that the current rate of a return is not a fair rate, that we, we recalculate that and make some smarter choices there, that we do it in consultation, uh, but we're realistic about what the economists say and the, the, the various professionals within the pension system say about how you create a sustainable system. That's what we want. But the rate of return, that's dealing more with your investments and how you're paying out the benefits that are owed to people. I mean, the other balance of that equation is the actual benefits that are paid out to people. And, you know, a way to deal with that is also to say, okay, beyond a certain, you know, people hired beyond a certain date, you, you're gonna just receive less in the long run than people used to, right? It's. Uh, again, there, there, there's two other elements, what the employee, the new employee pays, and that's an adjustable number, and what the employer pays, and that's an adjustable number. So you have three major elements of that equation, and they have to at some, po at some point balance in, in the long term. That's a sustainable system. So I don't think it's simple as just a determining a rate of return. So, um, Do you support divesting entirely from Russian companies or funds in those two big public pension programs because of the war in Ukraine? Well, of course, I, I think that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is absolutely outrageous. And uh, the, the toll, the human toll is just, uh, it's unfathomable what is happening there. So from a, a political platform, I would say absolutely, absolutely, without, without a doubt. But now your responsibility on a pension system is different than a political position. It's, a, it's not a political platform, it's a fiduciary platform. And you have an obligation uh, as we were just talking about in terms of pension funds and making sure you can pay out benefits to have a sustainable system. And that rate of return is a big driver towards that sustainable system. And so the evaluation is not based on my politics or yours. Of course, I think we should do everything we can to, to, uh, to hurt Russia because of their invasion. But we have to evaluate our investments in, in, in Russian assets as small as they may be with the, the issue of that fiduciary responsibility in terms of rate of return. And if, we, if, there, if, the, if the experts say that we can invest our money better and smarter and with an equal or better rate of return in another direction, that's an easy choice, absolutely. But you wanna have that evaluation. You don't want people on these pension boards making political statements. That's, I think that's the wrong situation. And as controller, I would take the fiduciary responsibility very, very seriously. And that means sometimes putting aside your own personal views. I remember one of my first political activisms as a student at San Diego State University was to push to divest our student investments out of uh, banks that were doing business in the, in the government of South Africa. And it was a big deal as we learned about the apartheid system, about the persecution of students of color uh, in South Africa. Uh, and we took that very seriously. And in that cir circumstance, the student body had millions of dollars in investments. When I became student body president, uh, I, along with my fellow students, decided that we wanted to divest. And that was a choice we made. Now, we weren't on a pension fund. We, we didn't have a fiduciary responsibility. We could make a political choice and make a statement, which we were very important for us to make, about apartheid. Now, that was my 
activist days, and that's different than what a controller would do on a pension board for the state of California. So you got to balance those two. Even if you have passion and angst about certain things that are happening in our world, you got to balance that with your responsibilities to get a rate of return for the retirees who are counting on that money. So are you saying you would not support total divestment or that you would need to talk to people at the pension board to make an assessment like you don't have an answer? I, I think I, I, I explained that, that I think you would do an analysis to see whether or not that divestment would create any kind of financial shortfall for the fund in which you have a fiduciary to, uh, to do uh, that work. So that, that's a calculation versus a, a black and white, I want to take our money out because I, as I said, I, I think from a you know, personal point of view, absolutely. I, I'd, I'd want to do everything I could to, to, uh, to hurt the, the Russian government, which is engaged in this incredible you know, international abuse. But I, I would think you know, that we wouldn't be in that investment if it wasn't making a good amount of money, right? I mean, you'd pull out of it for financial reasons, let alone political ones. But I mean, are, are you saying that, you know, that, you know, obviously there's Russia is doing this aggression that is very, as you said, outrageous? Um, that we might tolerate that and still put money in there if, if, it, if it pays off? Well, I think you got to get the facts. So I, that's where I always start on any kind of equation. What, what are the facts? I don't know the facts. Maybe you do. No, I'm just saying I would assume the facts are that this is not a bad investment. Well, you started by saying, you, pull it out for that you said, I assume. I don't assume on anything. Okay. okay? <laughs> that's, not, that's not my job to assume anything. So we want to get the facts. Uh, that's how you make good laws in my current job, and that's how you make good choices uh, in any future job. I mean, so you talked about the, politi <laughs> the political part of it and then the fiduciary part of it. Is there a moral dimension to it as well? And does that ever become a factor big enough to influence the decision? That's a hypothetical. I think, yes, sure. But now we have to go look at the facts. So um, we all want to you know, live in a planet that takes care of each other and uh, you know, advances peace over war and, and all the rest. So, um, so when you voted in committee for this SB 1328, this Mike McGuire bill, that was a, a political decision. And no, it specifically says in that bill that the, uh, they need to exercise their fiduciary responsibility. I did bring some bills here, but I did not bring that one. <laughs> but I think if you look in there more carefully, you will see that, that obligation uh, of, of being a proper fiduciary. And I'd be happy to send it to you uh, after this interview if you need access to that bill. So, I have some other bills I want to share. Not so that. with that same, I didn't think you'd ask me that, Alexis. <laughs> would, would that same kind of analysis uh, apply to uh, fossil fuel investments? Uh, yes, yes. So I mean, you would support changes that advance the cause of climate change, sustainability. I but certainly, if, from if, a political point of view, if, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a serious threat. Right. And we have to divest from uh, fossil fuels. And, um, but it's the same equation. It's the same evaluation that I gave earlier. So if those investments are making high rates of return, then that's something you have to consider. I think that's the, that, again, this is where you have to separate your political views with your financial obligations. And uh, that's, that's the equation that I would use to make my good, good choices as a fiduciary on a pension system board. It's not about being student body president of my student government now. This is a different responsibility, and I have to understand those differences very well. Um, we've talked about a couple of different, you know, investment-related policies for those two big pension <coughs> funds, but are there anything, is there anything else, you know, in terms of investing policies or other decisions that you'd want to change um, upon, you know, joining those two boards? I think we've talked about them. I think we want a sustainable system so that we can provide the, the benefits for the, the retirees and to do it in a responsible way. That's the frame in which I would, I would enter that service. Um, okay, I also have a question <coughs> about taxes. Um, you get all the, the, the financial questions today. Okay, fire away on taxes. Um, I don't like taxes. I, I have it on my governing principles that I've shared with you all, right? It's, uh, it's number five. Work hard to set priorities and hold the line on taxes. These are my governing principles. I think they're on my website if you're interested. That's senatorglazer.com. And I've kind of, I've used this to kind of guide me in uh, my service in the, in the Senate. Uh, you didn't ask me about questionnaires, but I, I didn't fill out any of them. I just put all my statements on my website so people could see and I set my governing principles. So you're asking about governing principle number five. 
See, I got that in there. You weren't going to ask me about my baseball cards, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, one of the questions, that, you know, conversation <clears throat> policymakers, wonky people have had recently is about comprehensive tax reform and specifically yes. the people are spending more money on services these days, mm -hmm. less money on goods, which are taxed in a certain way. Um, do you think, does the state of California need to make any changes to account for that shift in people buying more services? Well, <clears throat> I, I don't think that's a realistic path going forward. Um, uh, because what, what happens is that uh, it means that you're going to add the tax, you're going to increase the tax burden on the low and middle income folks in our state to the benefit of the wealthy. And I think that's a very tough sell. Um, and any change like that would likely have to be on the ballot and, and very likely to be unsuccessful. So while there's some logic to what you're saying, I'm not uh, sure that um, it's really a realistic uh, change that we're likely to see. Now, because of that, um, during my service in the Senate and with my colleagues in the legislature, we have, uh, because that's unlikely to change, we have made some very big course changes in how we budget. Um, when I first came, uh, it, well, I guess when I first came up here with Jerry Brown in 2010, 2011, we had a $28 billion deficit, uh, $20 billion of it was structural, and we had no money in reserves. Today, uh, under the budget plans that we're considering right now, we're going to have over a $40 billion rainy day fund. And we're experiencing, experiencing uh, what's projected to be about a $68 billion surplus uh, in terms of excess money from the projections for this current year budget and for the next. So because of the volatility that our current tax system provides, we have made serious commitments to try to create that that's that rainy day fund, so that as revenues go up and down, that we're going to be better protected. Uh, and I think that is the right thing to do in our current circumstance, because I think the likelihood of changing our tax code, even there's there's some logical reasons as to why that, that built-in volatility is bad. I'm not convinced that there really is a path forward in that space. But in addition to the flattening the income tax rate to address volatility, the tax reform plan was also to address the service industry by lowering the sales tax and broadening the base. You know, start taxing things like lawyers. So what about that part of uh, uh, tax reform? Barbers, accountants, uh, you know, you can go through tax preparers. So I, I think I, I answered it, but I'll answer it again because you're the big boss over there, uh, which is to say that um, all, all of those changes are going to change the, the obligation from the very wealthy, which is uh, we have a very progressive tax system. It's going to change it change? because it's going to it's going to when you when you when you uh, expand the base, that that means you're going to have more people paying taxes. And that means it's going to affect those that are uh, middle income and lower income are going to have to pay more because that's expanding the, the base of taxes. Now, if you said this would be a tax revenue plan then you should say this is a way to raise more money in taxes, right? Now, if you said it that way, then you'd say, okay, is that kind of a system to, do we need more money? Well, I just explained, we have a $68 billion surplus projected this year and next. And so the answer is no, we, we don't yeah, need more money. So not it's not a fundraiser. It's not a tax raiser. It's somehow it's an equalizer, right? Stable and it equalizes. Well, when you equalize and expand the base, you're bringing more people into the tax system, whether it's paying for services. And you lower the rate. Yeah, well. That's how you you don't bring in more money. You just lower the rate. Right, so you're paying, so more people are paying. So poor more, poor people are paying where this way works. But so, they're paying less than they would because they don't use lawyers. <laughs> anyway, so, I... So is, I mean, is volatility just the price that we pay for a progressive tax system? Is that, is that just the way it is? Uh, well, it, it the way, it, it the, it's the way it is today. And, it, you know, can it be changed? Uh, is there going to be public support for that type of a change? I, I, I'm just being straightforward with you. I, I'm, I'm skeptical that there is public support for that type of a change. So, you know, is that a constructive course forward? I'm not so sure that it is. I, I understand intellectually why uh, and, and the advantages of less volatility. I'm just not optimistic, I, you know, from my vantage point that uh, 
that it, it's a it's a it's a it's a likely and constructive path forward. So, under the current system and tax rates, do you have any concern that wealthy people are going to leave the state and at a certain point? Uh, no. <laughs> Why not? I don't think we see any evidence of that, and uh, you know, it doesn't doesn't mean that the next tax law we pass won't. Uh, uh, potentially create that dynamic, but I think that as if you look at uh, uh, our, our uh, high net worth individuals in the state, I think that uh, they still love California and all that we have to offer. It's the most dynamic, innovative place in the planet, the most beautiful, um, with great uh, 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 human resources, diverse highly intelligent, educated human resources to do incredible things that has allowed California to be such a dynamic economic force uh, in our nation and in the world. And um, I think that's a part of uh, why we have, we have a progressive tax code that I think is working, uh, even though it does build in volatility, which I acknowledge is not a good thing. So you have to overcompensate for that. And we've done it by savings at, a, at an unprecedented rate, uh, unprecedented. Uh, and credit to the governor, Governor Brown, Governor Newsom, the legislature, uh, for the willingness to put money aside for a rainy day. That's very hard to do. We have a lot of needs in the state. And I certainly, in my legislative service, have tried to constrain some of those expectations and some of those programs because I, I think about the long-term costs. So, but it's not so easy to do and to get support for that constraining of spending. Uh, but I think that's an important thing for us to do. Um, kind of piggybacking off the, you know, the questions about the tax rate on wealthier people in California, would you support an increase in the tax rate of the upper, upper income individuals? Well, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we have a $68 billion surplus, okay? So what's the reason that we should tax more? I don't see a reason that we should be looking to tax more. Uh, so uh, there's gotta be some justification for it and I'll, I'll keep my eyes and ears open for what that might be. But I think we're pretty well taxed in the state. Uh, and as I talked about my governing principles, I think that uh, we want to uh, hold, hold the line on taxes is, a, I think, a, a prudent thing to do. I mean, there is you no know, movement out there or uh, a cause out there to do that to help fund a single payer health care system. Right. So is that something that's worth increasing the tax rates for? All right. Well, that's a simple question with a very complicated answer. Uh, first, um, I, I was the only Democrat in the Senate to vote against the single payer system in 2017. So I, I took a stand at that point in time saying that where's the budget, where's the financing to show that we could make this work? Where are the cost controls? Where's the, uh, the allowance the federal government even allow us to do it? And uh, notwithstanding the fact that this would probably be need to be on the ballot for the people of California to decide. Um, now, when you look at the, uh, uh, the ins uh, you know, who is uninsured in California today, Obamacare added 4.5 million uh, Californians to the health insurance rolls, uh, getting us up to 93% health insurance uh, covered in our state. Actions that we have taken over the last few years to expand the health services to undocumented uh, add, I think, 2 or 3% to that. So we we're bordering on 96 to 97 percent of Californians being funded. There are many people that don't want health insurance. They refuse. So we're, we're doing a pretty good job. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. But single payer by a state uh, is almost unprecedented in the world. There are some countries that have tried it. There are some states that have tried it and took and abandoned it. Uh, and it's, it's very unclear to me that a single payer system first is financially feasible and secondly, uh, is pragmatically feasible and better than what we have today, where we have 96, 97% of uh, Californians in some sort of an insurance pool, whether it's through the state of California or whether it's through private employers being able to pick their doctors and all the rest. So um, I think there's always room for improvement in our healthcare system, don't get me wrong, but I don't think single payer is some magic bullet, especially done on a state by state uh, basis. I know you guys didn't want strong opinions from me, right? <laughs> All right, I'm only kidding, of course. Uh, this is important conversation, and I hope that the folks that are listening are uh, uh, taking something from it. So you you declared your candidacy right before the deadline, 
it was in fact after your fellow Democrats had even endorsed another candidate. So why at that point, um, why at that point run? Why did you decide to jump in and why so late? Well, late, there's a filing deadline that says you need to file by X to be a candidate. So I don't know by definition that that's late. I think, frankly, our election campaigns are too long. I think people are tired of all the politics where it goes on and on and on forever. And we forget that we're there to govern. And that's a big part of our responsibility. And there's a time for elections and there's time for governing. So the fact that I got in before the filing deadline, all appropriate and and, uh, and we have this very intense few months of campaigning is perfectly fine by me. I mean, I guess you could argue that I might be disadvantaged by doing something like that. I don't feel disadvantaged at all. I think that uh, I'm in this race to win. I think that there's a, a clear path for me to be successful. And uh, we'll see what the voters decide in terms of whether I bring the, the right combination of, of experience and, uh, and, and seasoned leadership with my uh, independent streak that allows me to uh, to be fearless against powerful interests in our state, as shown by my service in the Senate and beyond. And there, there was sort of a first half of that question, which was why, why run even as your fellow Democrats were already consolidating around another candidate? I've never been of the view that the party, whether it's the Republican Party or the Green Party or the Democratic Party, that they should be the ones to decide who is the, the nominee, who's the candidate, just because that the activists get in a room and they decide, you know, who, who they want to pick is somehow the way the voters of California want to decide their state leaders. That's why we have elections. Party, we don't have conventions deciding it. We have elections. So we are all going to engage in this election process. Uh, the parties uh, appoint, you know, the, the parties endorse me and they've not endorsed me. Uh, and that's just one element of an election campaign. Uh, but I think that the voters out there, as you see the declining party membership and the increase in in folks that are unaffiliated, I think it's an indication that there's extremes in the party and uh, there's polarization, something that, as you know, and have covered me in the past, that I've worked very hard against. Um, I'd like to advance a lot of bipartisan solutions, and we can talk about that if you want, but um, I don't see the party endorsement as a definitive issue whatsoever. Uh, they didn't endorse me for the Senate. Uh, they didn't endorse me for my re-election to the Senate. Why is that? Because that extremism that exists within the party, uh, they didn't like my, my center, my, the center lane that I occupy as a progressive but a fiscally responsible one that's willing to stand up to powerful interests in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party and elsewhere. That, that's the lane that I think works and why I got elected by my constituents in my area, because they, they like that combination. Even though the party said no, they said yes. And now we're going to give that same choice to the voters in June. And do you think the other Democrats in the race are, do not offer that to voters? A lot of the voters will make that choice. Okay. So Ashton, can you um, talk a little bit more about the, this path to victory that you see for yourself? Because, you know, as, as Alexi said, you have Malia Cohen was endorsed by the party. Um, you have Vladimir Chan who was endorsed by the Republican Party, right? Kevin DeLeon was endorsed for the U.S. Senate by the party. I mean, you want me to go through all the people that the party's endorsed that have lost? I mean, uh, that's, a, that's an assumption that you're making, and I don't think it's a good one. But look, uh, I think when people look at someone like me, they're going to see a seasoned state leader that has had experience at all levels of government, seen it from the inside and from the outside, worked in the legislature, worked for two governors, worked for the chief justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, I've been a city council member for 10 years, three terms as mayor, sit on the board of the trustees of the state university, a senator for seven years, um, and had my own business for 25 years working for environmental groups and nonprofits all across the state and the country. And so I bring a lot of depth of experience. But also what comes with that is this independent streak that has allowed me to take on the NRA and ban assault weapons, to take on the tobacco companies and, and ban, uh, and ban uh, the flavored tobaccos that have lured our children into uh, nicotine addiction. Uh, to take on BART and to create an inspector general to oversee BART. But if you look at my record, you're going to see example after example of, uh, of, of, of a fearless uh, legislator, uh, doesn't take gifts or travel from special interests, uh, but exercises uh, my, my work in a bipartisan, thoughtful way, um, and that's willing to say no uh, to the most powerful interests in our state, the business community, the unions, doctors, lawyers, you name it, health plans, you'll find examples of me willing to stand up on some of their excesses and say no. 
And that's how I've served as a legislator, and that's how I'll serve as a state controller. So have you ever considered leaving the Democratic Party and being a no party preference? I, I've been a Democrat my whole life. I've elected uh, many of our state leaders who are Democrats, the last one being Governor Jerry Brown. As you know, I ran his campaign for, for governor and served him in, at the early parts of uh, uh, his administration as a senior political advisor. Um, and the Democratic Party matches my, my progressive values that government collectively can help people, can care for people. I think what sets me at odds with my party is, and, and this speaks to also the, one of the reasons why I want to be state controller, is that um, if you know the value of that dollar to helping people in need, you want to make sure that dollar is spent correctly, that there isn't waste and fraud and abuse, and that it's effective. It's getting what we expect from it. And that's been my view as a legislator, and it's my view as a controller uh, if I am to be elected to that office. And that's that that dollar is valuable and important. And I think one of the mistakes of the Democratic Party is that they should be the most fiscally conservative party uh, in the state because they know how that tax, that fragile, that important ta tax dollar, uh, how important it is for educating our youth, for taking care of the infirm, the elderly, uh, the vulnerable. Uh, for you know, have, you know, preserving our wonderful open spaces and parks and our roadways, that that, that dollar means something. So let's make sure we, we're doing the best with it. It'll build better trust in government, and it will allow us to do the progressive things we want California to be, to be you know, all the things that we're doing. Have you encountered any criticism from people from um, your fellow Democrats at all? Uh, particularly for you coming in after the party has tried to elevate a woman of color, a black woman, into this into this role? No. Okay. Um, so why the why the controller position? And you just touched on this a little, but you know, compared to other uh, other positions you could run for. Uh, it's the chief financial officer for the state. It, it, its primary mission is to make sure every dollar uh, that the state spends is spent according to law and regulation and effectiveness. And so it's that, it's that match of that progressive value of how uh, government services can help people, our kids in school, our higher education system, our roads, our parks, our safety net, and, and, and knowing that, that, that uh, we need to make sure we're, we're spending that, that money correctly and well. And um, the controller is in that perfect nexus, that, that crossroads from the good ideas, uh, the good policies and laws that we want, and, and where the dollars go. It crosses right there in the controller's office. And so if you have an active controller that's a taxpayer watchdog, that you're in a position to, uh, to look into issues of effectiveness, not just compliance with the rules, but effectiveness. And when, uh, you know, the Democratic Party, we control all the offices in California uh, and state offices. Uh, and so there's, a, there's a, a tendency to say, we gotta be nice to everybody because they're part of our party. Uh, and there's, an, there's a uh, you know, erosion of that kind of oversight that's so important. It's a, it's a legislative responsibility, but it's also a responsibility of the office of the controller. And that's what I think a, a good activist controller will do, is to make sure that you take the good progressive ideas that we've put in the law, and you make sure that the money is being spent how it's supposed to be spent. We're putting a lot of money into homelessness. Is it getting better? No. We're putting a lot of money in our schools. We have more than 500 failing schools, so let's own up to the problem. We're spending $7 billion on mental health. Is it working? Well, no one wants to find out. We invest in our employment development department, $20 billion in fraud. So listen, we got to own up to our governing problems they're, they're big, they're challenging, and we need uh, independent voices that have the, the expertise and the professionalism, which the Office of the Controller has, to, to do that type of accountability without fear for who you may be offending, to make sure those tax dollars are spent correctly, so that all those good thoughts and ideas that we put into our laws are being carried out uh, in the most efficient way, so we build trust in government and we feel that we're... Um, you know, California is, is, is running on a good track, and that's not an easy thing to do, but it requires all hands on deck from a lot of places, including the Office of the Controller. So is one of the 
people that you're not afraid of offending Governor Newsom? I mean, you've mentioned no bid contracts under COVID. You've mentioned you know, this homeless spending, which he, right, he proposed. Um, what are your thoughts on the I, I think that uh, Governor Newsom's done a very good job under very difficult circumstances. Uh, are there things that uh, he could do better? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a big administration. I'd say the thing about my friend, Governor Brown, um, you can't help but, but, but uh, be, own up to where you're falling short. I think he'd, he'd say the same. And I have, I, have, I, have not, I have not cowled in that regard. You know, you can get your, v, your bills vetoed uh, when you criticize the governor. I've had 39 bills signed into law. He's vetoed a couple of mine. But I mean, for those of you who are paying attention during COVID, I, you know, I, I worked with the administration for a couple months early in the pandemic, and then you saw me step out and write some things that were perceived as critical of the governor and his COVID policies. In fact, I wrote, I think, five op-eds and published many things where I thought the governor and the administration could do better. It wasn't because I was trying to be mean. It was because I had a different perspective based on the facts as I saw them for the work that we were doing. Um, that's, I, I would say there's an element of uh, courage in that. Um, it'll be up to others to judge that. But I think it speaks to uh, my, my, the, my real record of a willingness to engage at all levels with a level of fearlessness that I've talked about and you were referencing. So certainly the administration uh, has such an important job to do and uh, it's, it's a big job. They don't always do it well, although I think Governor Newsom is doing well. It's not perfect and we know that. He knows it and so we all have to work together to do it better. But that still means an honest accountability from the Office of the Controller not a cowling because of the power of the administration. Uh, so another you know, financial issue in California is that it is tremendously expensive to build anything. Uh, it's been hard to get uh, enough affordable housing, to, to build roads, to build high-speed rail because everything is extremely expensive. Um, so why does it cost so much to build here? Is there anything the controller can do about trying to bring down those costs of, of publicly financed projects? I think what the controller can do, both in this area that you're referring to um, and in others, is to always uh, ser uh, search out the facts and the data and to be transparent about it. And um, I think that goes a long ways to having people own up to why we have problems that we're fixing or we're not fixing. And uh, so I think as, as we uh, learn about how money is being spent, then everybody's there to judge whether it's being spent in the right way. If it costs us six or $700,000 for every new uh, uh, sh uh, you know, uh, affordable housing unit that we create in the state, is that really gonna get us out of this problem? Um, or we have to rethink how, how we're doing it. And if costs are going up, why is that? Because of what? Is it a regulation that we've in, uh, established? Does it make sense? You know, I've been out there talking about the California environmental quality streamlining as an example of where our regulations have created, um, you know, cost uh, impacts. And if we didn't change our environmental standards, but streamline how we reviewed those, those concerns that are raised in the course of a development project, that we could lower costs and make it uh, more efficient for the private sector. And keep in mind the private sector is where most of this housing has to come from. They're the ones who have to take the risks and get the rewards to build that housing that we so desperately need. So it's to, it's to be a, a truth teller on the facts and the data. And you know the, the controller doesn't have a vast uh, array of, of uh, you know, auditors. So you have to make choices. You have to make choices in that space. Um, but uh, you, can, you can't be shy about uh, digging down and, and displaying for public viewing those facts uh, with, with good transparency. And that's something that I support. I have a bill in the legislature right now. The, 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 the controller's office is supposed to be the portal for all the salaries that are expended in the state, local and state. But two thirds of our school districts don't comply. I have a bill to mandate that the schools have to comply in providing that data to the controller so there's transparency uh, behind it, uh, which is again, a fundamental part of that job is to follow the money, make sure it uh, complies with our rules and laws, and then to be transparent uh, on exactly uh, what you find and how, how the money is being spent. 
So I have legislation on that that I, I brought a copy of it for you guys if you uh, want to take a look at it. But uh, look, it, it has opposition. It has opposition. The school districts don't like it. The teachers union doesn't like it. Uh, I, I, I tell them that it, transparency works for you. It's going to show how low we paid our teachers are. They, they are they, you know, we should pay them more. But it'll also show that we pay some principals and superintendents hundreds of thousands of dollars. We have a superintendent down in Southern California making more than $500,000, medium-sized school district. If you don't have transparency, if you don't get the facts out, then people wonder where the money's going. So the controller's office that can play a central part in that. And when there's public entities that don't want to comply, that the controller has to step up and, and uh, work with legislators, uh, as I'm doing right now, to, to, uh, to try to require that transparency. Would you, um, as, as controller, would you pursue any legislation? Do you think like sponsoring bills or anything like that? Or would you stay focused solely on sort of the I think it depends on the problems that you encounter and what's required. Does it require a change in law? In the case of uh, school districts reporting salaries, uh, there's a dispute about what the law says. So I have a bill. Uh, I have a bill to, you know, clear up that dispute. So there'll be no argument if you uh, put a bill in, get it enacted into law, and then there's no dispute. So as controller, if I see uh, places in which uh, uh, legislation would provide better clarity and accountability, you bet. I'll be engaged with my colleagues in the legislature. Okay. Anything else? I'm really enjoying the Cal Matters mug. <laughs> <laughs> nonprofit journalism. We got to support nonprofit journalism. I get, well, you're welcome to it. That you probably gets sure. edited out. I don't take gifts, so that probably gets edited out. Um, but I, I am doing stuff in the area of, of journalism. I mean. Uh, when you talk about trust in government, part of the challenge that we're facing as a democracy is the demise of, of media outlets across the state. Almost a third disappeared in the last 20 years. So I have a bill, SB 911, to try to uh, take the model of, a, of a public broadcasting. Corporation for Public Broadcasting gets federal money and then can disperse it to nonprofit uh, uh, public television and media across the, uh, the country. And I'd like to see the similar model created in California. Uh, to help our community newspapers, our ethnic papers, our nonprofit outlets. Uh, it's not a, you guys don't endorse, so I'm not, you know, just trying to, <laughs> but, but no, but I, it's a serious point though. And you guys know it or you wouldn't be in this business and you wouldn't be talking to me uh, that you know the, the power of information. And uh, just think if there was a free press in Russia, how the world would be different right now. So we can, it's a fragile thing, our democracy at many levels, elections, uh, confidence, trust, uh, oversight through the media, all those things all come together in a very fragile system that we take for granted. And that's unfortunate. And um, I think the events of the last few years have made it clear that we can't take it for granted. And we have to have that vigilance and, and take steps to make sure we're, you know, our elections are transparent and clear and, and supported so people have confidence in the results. Um, that government leaders are making the choices for the right reasons so that public trust in, in, our, in our representative government stays strong. And I think we feel like it's been, it's, it's, it has experienced some, uh, some fraying over the last few years. So these are very important parts. Uh, and I, as I, I talked about at the beginning, in terms of who's in leadership locally, statewide, nationally, that, that a fundamental part of all of our work in terms of making decisions for our communities is to build that trust and understanding through transparency, through engagement, through honesty. It's one of the reasons why I, didn't, I don't fill out any questionnaires from interest groups. Uh, when I first ran for office, I had 34 of them, uh, and I didn't fill out a single one because I don't think secret promises, private promises, is a healthy way to do it. I encourage you to ask all the folks that come in for your interviews, uh, have you filled out these questionnaires? Would you share them with us so we can see your answers? I think that's a very important uh, qualification for offices, no secret promises. And it goes beyond me. I say, go ask everybody running for governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general. If you've made commitments, share them. Let everybody know, not just that interest group. There are some interest groups when you go in for your interview, just like this, they film you answering their questions. Why do they do that? Because if you deviate from your commitment that you're making in that private back room to them, they have video evidence of you making that promise. 
Is that just a horrible thing? A terrible thing? Now, this is for everybody to see. I'm not, you know, I'm not relating this to the work that you're doing because you're putting it up and everybody gets to watch it. But for other interest groups, they, they give you that, that questionnaire and you know what they want you to say. They, you, they know the commitment they want you to make. And so you can make it, but then let everybody know about it. So when you're in that, if you're elected and you're in that hearing room and you're deciding that issue and you've made a promise, and they, they know you made the promise. Don't make it be a secret promise. So I encourage you, you guys... Uh, practicing great, great journalism. But this issue of secret questionnaires stays around and it just goes back into the smoke-filled rooms again uh, because people forget about it. But go ask them whether it's a questionnaire from a business group or a union group, doesn't matter. If you filled them out, share it with everybody to see. And when journalists and editorial boards engage in this electoral process, you guys should ask us, give us your questions. You're coming in for an interview, then we'd love to hear your views and please give us all your questionnaires. What's wrong with that? And that's a way we have to improve our democracy. That was my little commercial. So, so are you suggesting that the other candidates who are running for controller have done that? Have you have to ask them. They don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> if okay. your pitch to voters is about being this independent watchdog on the state government, on the governor's office, on the legislature, and all of that. Um, what what is your argument for why you're better suited to do that than say Lonnie Chen, who has, you know, as a Republican, has less of a connection to all of those Democratic colleagues that you've worked with, yeah, in the legislature, on legislation, with you know, with the governor and, and so on. Yeah, a couple a couple of responses. Number one is uh, you have to know stuff. You don't have to sit in an ivory tower pretending like you uh, know what's going on. You, you, you really have to have some experience to understand where the bodies are buried or how things are really done. Uh, and I have, a, I have a long record, okay? And you can say that's, uh, it, uh, does experience matter? Does knowledge matter? I think it does. I think that knowing stuff matters. Um, uh, number two, uh, you know, we're in a, a polarized political world these days. And what happens in that circumstance that we find ourselves in is that uh, the Democrats are in charge, you get criticism from the Republicans, and it's just partisan uh, spitballs being thrown you know, uh, in, in, you know, at, the, at the, the people in power. Uh, and that it doesn't get the uh, examination because it's always put in that partisan frame. When you have someone of the same party uh, speaking truth to power and, 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 and following wherever the facts take you, um, I think that that's a platform that gets a lot more attention uh, from the media and from others that, uh, because they know that it's, it's, uh, it's man bites dog. You're not supposed to say uh, things about you know, the administration when you're in, your party's in charge of it. So I, uh, this isn't out of disrespect for the individual you mentioned, but I do think that my work as controller uh, uh, in following the facts, not a political agenda, but following the facts, uh, whether it's in an audit or other type of, 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 of over, uh, overview, um, and being transparent about it will have a lot more impact and change for the better than someone from the other party that we've just seen as another partisan shot that we are experiencing on the state and national level. And finally, uh, Alexis, I would say this. Um, you know, I, I have a long record, and you've covered some of it. And you've seen me stand up to my party at all kinds of levels, uh, whether it was not supporting the gas tax, uh, whether it was uh, raising some criticism about uh, uh, COVID, uh, whether it was the work that I did at the university to advance a four-year graduation requirement, uh, which wasn't uh, accepted very happily by the faculty and others. Uh, but you also have seen that, uh, the dramatic success that have come from that. Uh, five, six years ago when I advanced my uh, efforts on the four-year graduation rate at the state universities, it was 19% uh, graduate in four years in California. Today, it's over 31%. 31%. That's a, that's, that's, and and the, and the system has as, as said they want to get to 40% by 2025. And listen, I didn't do that. Uh, you had great faculty and administrators and, and system leaders, uh, but I contributed to it. Uh, in, in pushing and prodding and, and, and in partnership with Governor Brown to provide some resources to help uh, clear out bottleneck courses and adding advising and, and doing various things. But, but that's an example of criticism combined with 
a reform that's making a difference. And I think if you look through my record, you're going to see that at a lot of levels, uh, whether it's about advancing uh, education data, uh, whether it's the work that I've done on uh, small business lending, truth in lending, passed the first bill in the country to require that a financier has to disclose the rate of re the, uh, the cost of money when they're lending to a business. There's no state in the country that has that as a requirement. If you have a credit card, you see the annual percentage rate on it. It's very clear what you have to pay in interest. In business borrowing, there's none of that. There's no disclosure anywhere. And, and small business is very subject to manipulation. Took on the finance companies, passed a bill to change that to make it better. I'm a problem solver at, at, at heart. And that's why sometimes the partisan politics is so bothersome to me. It's also why almost every one of my bills has had a Republican co-author or a Republican support, because I know that our policies long-term are bene benefit uh, when they're bipartisan. In fact, I put that on my, my baseball card here. It says here, number three, pursue bipartisan decisions. They're always better and longer lasting. And I think if you look at my record again, you'll see a consistency behind the standards and principles I've set in terms of how I've done my, my hopefully my best work. Are you going to update this at some point with like stats, like a baseball card would have, like bills introduced, bills passed, you get your little percentage? That, I, and... I, you know, I've had six additional versions of this. I'll have to make sure you get a full, full set, but I haven't done that one exactly. I don't like to. The one thing about elections and my friends tell me, Steve, you have to talk about your accomplishments because I'm, I'm generally, I know this will surprise you, but a pretty hum, humble, humble guy. And if I ever said I in this, it really is we because uh, you can't do anything alone. So, uh, but yeah, I, uh, I, I suppose that would be a fun exercise. So I'm, I'm open to the idea. Yep, and the second bubble though. <laughs> that, that's extra cost, <laughs> but I, I did like the bubble gum. Well, thanks for coming, Steve. This thank is you. much appreciated. Okay, guys, thank you for the engagement. I always enjoy the conversations, you know, and uh, I hope that who's ever watching, make sure you vote, even if it's not for me. Mm -hmm.